Well, welcome to MEX Online Campus. I once read a book many years ago titled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And it's a fun book. So what is it that uh, he put, teased out that we learn at the ripe old age of five that serves us so well in the years to come? Well, it's things like share everything, play fair, uh, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Uh, flush. <laughs> and it was true. Most of what we really need to know in life, we learned in kindergarten. But there is one that didn't make the list, but should have. Don't do stupid. <laughs> Today, we're starting a series on not doing stupid. But with a very specific angle, as you've probably already seen, it's not doing stupid when it comes to marriage. Now, for those of you who aren't married and are already thinking, gosh, I can check out during this series, please think again. Uh, and for two reasons. The first is because we're not just talking about post-marriage stupid, but we're talking about pre-marriage stupid. And second is because I know that the most, and this is just for me, speaking personally, the most formative teaching about marriage and family that I received for my life came before I was married. It came before I was even engaged. So this is a series that I believe will be very important for you if you're even open to being married one day, think you might be married one day. And for those of you who are married, you need to dial in on the pre-married stupid stuff too, because the very things that you might be dealing with right now in your current marriage may go back to those premarital issues, those premarital decisions that weren't ideal, and at the time you didn't know they weren't ideal. And there's no way you can deal with those unless you can name them and identify them. So everything we're gonna talk about in this series is going to be relevant to all of us, married or unmarried. So let's jump in, beginning with the first of four stupid things, a four week series, and we'll look at four different things, beginning with the first stupid thing we can do. And it's the one that falls into a before you marry category. Here's the stupid you don't wanna do. Marry someone who is a spiritual mismatch. Okay, let me unpack that. Uh, first, let's touch base with the Bible on this. If you're a Christ follower, God's will for your life is that whoever you marry should be a follower of Christ as well. This is all through the Bible, but let me just give you a couple of examples uh, just from the book of 1 Corinthians, um, First and 2 Corinthians. In writing to the church at Corinth, the apostle Paul writes, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. And in a second letter to the Corinthians, he adds, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? Now, why is that such a big deal? And why would it be stupid to violate it? Well, it wasn't meant to put people who don't share the Christian faith down or to arbitrarily limit the playing field. It was meant to protect people from spiritual mismatches and the pain and separation that can come from that mismatch. And there's no greater mismatch relationally than a spiritual mismatch because it's the highest, deepest level of intimacy two people can share. That's worth a little review. There are four levels in any marriage relationship, four levels of intimacy. The first level is the physical level, which is just finding somebody attractive. I mean, and it's also the most superficial of the four. It may be what first made you look their way, but it's not enough to sustain a relationship over the long haul. And for obvious reasons, I mean, first looks don't last. You've heard the uh, line from Proverbs, probably you may not have known it's from the biblical book of Proverbs, but it's the line, you know, beauty is fleeting. But there's more to it than somebody losing their looks. It's when someone's looks become lost on you. I mean, haven't you ever met someone for the first time or seen them from a distance? And in your eyes, they were just dropped dead gorgeous. Um, but then they opened their mouth and they weren't drop dead gorgeous. They just made you feel like dropping dead. I mean, isn't it amazing how fast our assessment of physical beauty is altered by things like personality 
and intellect and humor and mannerisms and values and maturity and temperament. <laughs> This, this has always struck me as funny, but here's how it's talked about again in the book of Proverbs. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful face on an empty head. Kind of nails it. And anyone who's been married for very long and who has had a long and lasting marathon marriage that is getting sweeter with age, you know, it's gone past the 10-year mark, the 20-year mark, it's gone past the 30-year mark or more, will tell you that the physical attraction you have for your spouse comes from so much more than what they look like. It's driven by such deeper issues. You know, in just a few weeks, Susan and I will have been married for 38 years. Our anniversary is in November. And she is truly more physically beautiful to me uh, than when I married her. I'm not just saying that. I mean, she it, she just is. And, and it's because there's so much more to our relationship than a physical dimension. Um, and it's been nurtured, and it's been fed, and it's been developed over nearly 40 years. So when I look in her eyes, oh my goodness, I just don't lock eyes with anything more beautiful to me. So that's the first level of intimacy, physical, just raw physical, and it's also the most superficial. Then there's the intellectual level, where you challenge and stimulate one another. You share thoughts, and you share ideas, and, and you have these robust and, and these deep conversations. Um, there's an interesting little bit of trivia in the Bible about King David and his wife, Abigail. They didn't have a long courtship, but the heart of what impressed him wasn't simply that she was physically attractive, but that she was smart as a whip. The Bible goes out of its way to point this out. When it's describing the nature of David's attraction to her, it says, well, she was an intelligent and beautiful woman. David was attracted to her first and foremost for her mind which means as a couple, they had the ability to engage each other on an intellectual level, to find each other interesting and thought-provoking. But you can still go deeper, which brings us to the emotional level of intimacy. This is enjoying each other's company and just having a chemistry with each other. You just, you get along and you like being together. They're your best friend. Uh, the person who makes you laugh, the one you can't wait to watch the movie with, the one you can't wait to take that trip with. In the Song of Solomon, this is how a woman describes her husband. She says, his mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. And then she adds, this is my beloved. This is my friend. Okay, that's a powerful combination. My beloved and my friend. So you have the physical, the intellectual, and the emotional. Now, most people stop there. I mean, what else is there, right? If they have those three in place, they talk of that person as being their soulmate. But in truth, they haven't even gotten to the soul level yet. Because there is a fourth level, and that level is the spiritual level. This is when you relate to each other in light of your mutual connection with God, your soul. Your spiritual life is the deepest part of who you are. And when that is shared with your spouse, held in common with your spouse, both of you together communing with God, sharing those values and those priorities and those commitments, your intimacy is at the deepest level which means that the journey toward full and complete intimacy with each other as a married couple is ultimately a spiritual journey. But if you don't reach that level, if that is not a shared dynamic of your relationship, then that will forever remain unexplored territory, no matter how strong the relationship is or how well you might even get along with each other. And don't water this spiritual level down. We're talking about capital S spiritual, not small s spiritual. When some people talk about having a spiritual connection with someone, they're often talking about something like, I don't know, great chemistry or deep affection or supercharged emotional feelings, or maybe connecting in unique ways over small s spiritual events or activities like holding hands and silently soaking in a sunset in a meditative way, all of which is well and good. But those things are not what this level is about. This level is about both of you being in a personal relationship with the living God and through that, having God provide and create this fourth level for your relationship. In fact, that's the idea of two becoming one in and through marriage. Let me, let me read how Jesus put it. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, 
a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Okay, that's, that's the goal of marriage. Such intimacy, such bonding at the highest spiritual level by God himself that the two become one. Uh, but becoming one is a God thing. It's a spiritual act. Two becoming one happens when God joins two people together because you can't get that close apart from connecting spiritually. If a relationship with God isn't present in both lives, he can't join you together. He can't be the tie that binds. You have to share spiritual territory in order to cross over to each other in and through that territory, which is why this is the most important dynamic of married life. But so many people don't even have this on their checklist. All they care about is, do I find this person physically attractive? Do we have the same interests? Do we like the same movies? Do they make me laugh? Do they want children? When the real question is, do they have a shared relationship with Jesus? Now, I want to keep chasing this. Let's say you agree with me. I'm not saying you do, but let's just pretend that you do. Let's say you want to marry someone who is a spiritual match. And I know there's a lot of you out there that that is where you're at. Are you dating that way? You better be. Let's play it out. And I'll just paint it from the woman's perspective. A woman finds herself attracted to a man, and he is attracted to her, and so he goes into full pursuit mode. And by the way, there's nothing more intoxicating, more alluring to someone than being pursued. Couple that with a deep desire for love and companionship and marriage and family, and that woman is already instantly vulnerable. But she knows enough to check him out spiritually, and of course he passes the likes puppies, wants kids, of course I believe in God test. She asks about church, and then it starts to get a little fuzzy. He throws up a line or two about organized religion, being turned off to church because of all the hypocrites, and that he feels closer to God in nature than he does in a building. In other words, all the normal kind of pat responses that are often smoke screens where you want to appear spiritual but not religious, which in turn often means that you're neither spiritual or religious. But no worry, she asks if he'd be willing to go to church with her, and he says, sure. I mean, he's thinking in his mind, hey, cheap date. And not only that, it's part of the pursuit. See, that, that's what she often doesn't see. He's after her. The church thing, the God talk, it's like sending roses and candy. It's like putting candles on the dinner table. It's like straightening up the apartment before she comes over. He is in hot pursuit. God's stuff is just part of getting the girl. And she buys it. And she starts opening up her heart to the relationship. But then a strange thing happens. The more she gets to know him, the more they really have some of these really deep conversations about the most important things, uh, the more she sees this, he's not really very spiritually developed at all. In fact, he's never given his life to Christ. He believes in God, but only in the most general kind of cultural sense. In terms of Jesus being a deep and driving factor in his life, in terms of having come to Jesus as flat-out leader and forgiver in terms of him being a spiritual leader for the relationship, oh, it's just, it's just not there. And she's starting to see it with ever-increasing clarity. But she buries it. She buries it. She doesn't let it come into full view. She doesn't think about it or tries to get it out of her mind. And here's why. Because she let it get this far, because she didn't take the spiritual mismatch seriously on the front end and just dove right into romantic dating, something has happened. She's given her heart. And emotions are now overruling her intellect and her head. So she starts the evangelistic dating routine. <laughs> she starts buying him books and sending him links to look at and, and connecting him with Christian friends and having him read blogs and listen to certain podcasts and messages. She's just on a mission to transform him, to make him into someone that he was not. Now that she sees what he's not and never really was, but she's romantically involved, she decides to fix it or try to fix it by giving him a spiritual makeover. And he lets her do it to a degree. Uh, he takes the books, he might comment on some of the links, says he's open, and because he plays along, she thinks she's covered, she thinks she's making progress with him, that, that, that that's something she doesn't have to worry about anymore. So when the question comes, will you marry me, uh, she's already said yes a thousand times in her heart. 
uh, and never once let no enter her mind. But she goes for the spiritual prenup. <laughs> Will you keep going to church with me? Will we raise our kids in a Christian home? Will Christ be in this? You know, will you continue your, your exploration and development? Now, what's he going to say? Is he going to say, are you kidding? <laughs> That's all been part of the wine and roses, candles and dinner. Babe, once I, I get you down the aisle, Sundays are for my recliner and football and chicken wings and Budweiser. You can do what you want, but count me out. Um, feel free to raise the kids, however, but you know, I'm, yeah. Is that what he's going to say? Not likely. He's going to say, of course I want God in our life. Uh, but he's just after the deal. And once he gets the deal, he's done. Now, hear me on this. This isn't a bad guy. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's not out to purposefully deceive. His heart is gone too, uh, which is why he'll do anything, say anything, give anything to win you. He's probably even sincere about some of it because he's so deeply sincere about you. But when the deal is done and the aisle is walked, Make no mistake that that's when reality kicks in. The wedding becomes a memory. The romance fades. You find sex is not everything, much less living together and setting up a home and celebrating holidays and playing house. And then that's when it happens. You realize that connecting spiritually really was everything for marriage and family. You realize that you're going to be spending the waking up every day to someone that you can never share the deepest part of who you are with. You can never grow together in the places that matter most. You can never talk about the most important of things. You're not even going to be approaching life and decisions from the same footing. Suddenly, Mr. Perfect isn't perfect anymore. But that's the point. He never was. Because what makes someone perfect wasn't there to begin with. The deepest, most important thing in your relationship was missing. And when kids come along and the spiritual leadership isn't there for them either, which means that spiritually you become a single parent mom. And you, who so wanted marriage, who so wanted a family, and you remain devoted to both, carry a grief, even a guilt that you can't ever escape. You want to know how I can tell this story? Because I've seen it a thousand times. And if someone comes alongside you and tells you their story of dating someone who wasn't a Christian and they want him to Christ, and now he's this godly guy leading the family spiritually as if that's an okay plan to follow, you tell yourself that not only is that the most extreme exception to the rule, but that woman played with fire and she took the greatest relational risk anyone could ever take that's not a yay God story as much as it's an oh my God story, like seeing someone who just barely uh, misses getting hit by a truck. So please don't believe the lie. Go deep on this one. And let me give you two gut check questions to ask about anyone you might date if there's any fuzziness on this. First, can they describe a specific time or era during which they received Christ's gift of eternal life? And second, if they were put on trial on a charge of being a committed follower of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict them? If the answers on those don't line up, please don't, I mean, just hear my counsel. Don't open yourself up emotionally to someone who you know from the outset isn't right for you. Someone who isn't God's person for you. And if they are a spiritual mismatch, you know they aren't right. And if you've already started dating them, I mean, I would end it. Why open up your heart? Make yourself vulnerable to something that should never be. You shouldn't. Be friends all day long, but keep it there. Don't set yourself up. Don't even start the dating process. And if you already have, and this entire conversation that I've been having is making you extremely uncomfortable, then forgive me, but good. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, but good. And if I could talk to you, you know, as a father, I'm going to tell you, dear heart, please break it off. You know, son, break it off. If they come to faith later, naturally on their own, yay, God. But right now, don't, don't run that risk. 
And if they say something like, you know, if you really loved me, you would just accept me for who I am and what I am and not try to change me. Uh, you need to go ahead and put that in the category beyond stupid. It goes into the insanity category. I mean, would you buy that line for anything else? If they had, you know, sketchy ways with money or sketchy ways with sex or sketchy ways with legal activities or abusive behavior, would you ever buy them saying, but if you really loved me, you know, you would accept me? No. So why would you accept that line for the most important area of all? But more importantly, if you're a Christ follower, you're to love God even more than them. And the faith of your children and having a Christ-centered home is what you want most in marriage. Now, uh, for all you guys I just finished describing who are watching online, maybe you're even sitting there with your Christian girlfriend who got you to watch this service, uh, I know it sucks to be you right now. <laughs> but can I say something to you? And just as an older Christian man, if I could have a maybe a father moment with you as one of my sons, quit screwing around with spiritual things and get serious about your faith, please. And not to get her, but to get God. Then you might actually really deserve her. And then the two of you one day really could be one. But right now, you know, man up in the most important way possible. Own where you are spiritually and get serious about exploring it and start being the man that God calls you to be because he loves you. And man, does he have a vision for your life. Well, before we end, let me save myself a lot of time with emails and trying to respond on social media and close out talking about people who are already in a spiritually mismatched marriage. First, let me say a word to those of you who uh, represent the faith person in the relationship. You're on the Jesus side of things and your spouse isn't. What do you do now? Well, don't divorce. A spiritual mismatch, even if not God's plan, is not grounds for getting a divorce. Instead, let's talk about what to do in the context of marriage that might help. Beginning with what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't be annoying. <laughs> Uh, you shouldn't shove it down their throats. Instead, exercise appropriate restraint. The Bible says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, notice now, with gentleness and respect. But that's not what you'll want to do. <laughs> I know. What you'll want to do is sneak into his car and set his radio on the Christian radio station so that it comes on when he drives to work in the morning. Or you'll want to put post-it notes with Bible verses on the bathroom mirror. You'll want to stick books in her suitcase before she heads out on that business trip. Go easy. Take the Bible's advice. Be ready to share, but do it with gentleness and respect. And do you know the best way to do that? The Bible says to focus on living out your faith. Focus on you. In fact, let me read you the specific counsel the Bible gives for someone in a spiritually mismatched marriage. It's kind of put in terms of the wife to a husband, but it could be very much a husband to a wife. So let me just read this specific counsel for someone in a spiritual mismatched marriage. Be good wives to your husbands. Be responsive to their needs. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. What is going to be most convincing to your spouse is to simply let God do his work in you and change you into the person that he wants you to be. Your character, your attitudes, your outlook, as they see you become more and more a person of integrity and humility and, and gentleness and grace and love and self-sacrifice, they will see increasingly that you have something that they don't and that they desperately need and desperately want. And they'll be forced to look at the reality of Christ's presence in your life as the driving generator of that. Now let me say a word to those of you on the receiving end. And I'll speak to you as if you are the husband because most of the time, I, you know, that's the way it plays out. Not all the time, but let me just pretend I'm talking to a husband now who is not the person of faith. Do you know what's going on with your faith-filled Christian wife? She's scared and she's hurt because you're not open to faith. 
She so wants you to lead the family spiritually, to take the lead in this relationship. She so wants you to know Christ. She's frustrated because something that has become so important to her can't be shared with you and she loves you so much. She's afraid because she doesn't know what the future will be like if she keeps growing in a relationship with Christ and you don't. She fears that the gap between the two of you will just keep getting wider and wider and even more important, even though you don't buy into this yet, she fears that day when the person she loves most in this world will stand before a holy God in judgment. So will you do something for her? And obviously for yourself, be open to faith. Go into exploration mode. I mean, you're a bright guy. Check into it. If you've got questions about science, get them answered. If you've got questions about the Bible, get them answered. If you've been burned by Christians or a church, process it. Because, you know, I don't care what you've seen or what you've experienced that might have made you cynical. I understand the cynicism, but I don't know what it might have been. But those are people-driven experiences. They weren't Jesus-driven experiences. They were distortions of the Christian faith, distortions of Jesus. So just make sure you sort that one out. And here at Mac, this is one place that will do everything it can to help you do just that without ever making you feel awkward about it. Because many of us had to do the exact same thing. So explore your spouse's faith. If you love her and there is potential to reach the highest level of intimacy, isn't it worth checking out? And what if it's true? What if then you find out it's true, it's real, it's vibrant, it's life-changing? You think what that could mean? the highest level of intimacy with your spouse, Christ living and breathing and present and unifying and empowering your marriage, the two really becoming one, and then from that rocking your family's world and altering your entire eternity. I mean, what's the downside? Uh, have you ever heard of Pascal's wager? Um, he was a French intellectual in the 17th century who put all stuff with God in terms of a wager. He put it that you're going to bet with your life in one of two ways, that there is a God or that there is not a God. He said, if you live your life, if you place your bet, like there is a God and then there is, you've won. If you live your life like there isn't a God and there is, you're screwed. That's my definition of the French. <laughs> if you live your life like there is a God and there isn't, you've lost nothing. So when it comes to living as if there is a God or exploring whether there is a God, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. So for your sake and for the sake of your family, explore. It's a no-lose scenario. Okay, next week, another area of marriage where you don't want to do stupid.